I'm here to tell you the tale of the two worlds that I live in. One that's rooted in art, and the other one that's rooted in science. It's really the tale about culture, and about how our professional cultures interact with one, you know, one another. But first, let me tell you a little bit about my background. You see, I started out college when I was three years old. You, know, you think I'm brilliant, right? But let me tell you how I managed it. I thought about this in the womb, and I planned it out. I thought, how can I get there? Really, here's what it was. My dad was a barber, and my mother went to nursing school. And we couldn't afford babysitting. So what did we do? I went along to nursing school with my mother. And I would go to nursing school with her, and I would look at her books. And I would sit there, and she gave me a pile of paper. And she said, honey, just sit there and draw. I'd be like, OK, mom, I got this. So I would sit there, and I would draw. And I would look through her nursing books. And I would go, oh, ooh. Wow, ooh, wow. And then she surrounded me with National Geographics, which is even more interesting as a young child, because then you're like, oh, wow, the world, it's very interesting, right? And so I sat there and I drew, and I drew. And my parents, no matter what I asked for, they would give it to me. And I would go to my grandmother's house for babysitting again. And they'd say, here's a tissue box. I'd say, OK, it's a tissue box. What can I do with that? I'd take tissues, I'd wad it up into a ball, I'd take another tissue over the top of it, tie it with string, and I'd hang it up, put a face on it, and I'd made ghosts, ghosts that hung in the window. And this love of being able to take my hands and build things, it progressed. So that in middle school, I actually started to make pom-pom animals. Now, I'm a little bit older than a lot of you in the audience. This isn't the time when you could go buy pom-poms, and you could go buy the little googly eyes, and you could put it all together, put it in there, and then you make this like little product. No. What I was doing is taking yarn, wrapping it around my hands, tying it in a knot, making my own pom-poms, making my hats to go on the top of the animals. Then I went around the neighborhood, and I sold them. <laughs> I made $85. <laughs> I was very, very proud of myself. And that started off my journey as a product designer. And I went to, my dad said, you have to go to college. I said, OK, I'll go to college. He said, but you can't do that art thing. You got to make a living. And I'm like, but I like to draw. He's like, no, 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 you have to make a living. I'm going to really like science. But that really wasn't my calling, because I really like to draw. So I went to design school. And in design school, I had to do things like design a lawnmower. And I had to design an Indy 500 car at one time. And I was like, you know, it's not feeling it really not feeling that wall sconce. No matter how much I try, that wall sconce is there. It's shining light. It's doing its job. But I'm not really feeling that wall sconce. And we have this great thing called the co-op program. So I went on this job. And I remember, I showed up to the job interview, and I forgot my resume. And, I had, and, I, and as I was there, they're like, do you have your resume? And I was like, I sent it in the mail. Didn't you get it? And I said, I really just want to learn. That's what I want to do. And the company was a medical device company. And it was here, I said, ah, oh, I found what I love. I get to do science in design. That's fantastic. So I learned how to take science and apply it to my design. And I learned that through medical devices, I get the opportunity to explore and learn from so many wonderful people. And then I get to come back and I get to design. Now, you may ask yourself, what is a medical device? And what is that? Well, medical devices are required for life to exist as we know it. It could be something as complex as an LVAD system that keeps you alive while you await heart surgery, or it can be an everyday item, like your eyeglasses, a toothbrush, or even your Fitbit. It can just, make, just improve health and well-being. So it's very, very diverse. In fact, in the Federal Registry, the definition of a medical device, two and a half paragraphs long. In Europe, it's also two and a half paragraphs long, but they have a caveat. If you call it a medical device, it is a medical device. <laughs> now, what I learned in design school is that design is really, really fun. It's a complex process. It lives at the crossroads of technology, innovation, culture, and environment, all wrapped up together. And what's important when we design is that we know who we're designing for, what's the purpose or the need, and what's the underlying value that we're going to bring?
The best thing about designing a medical device is the fact that you're going to actually help people. Not that a wall sconce doesn't help people because we need to see our lighting as we go to the movie theater, but this impacts our life in a meaningful way. So, in 2004, I took a leap. I took a commitment. And I started to only design medical devices. And in this role, I've had the opportunity to learn from so many wonderful people. I've had the opportunity to design devices that truly do impact patient care on a daily basis. I've had the opportunity to join a clinical department, to have a rare glimpse of the inside of how a clinical department practices, the life of a physician, the life of a nurse. I've had the opportunity to participate fully in the medical device industry and to help form some of its standards. And in order to develop a medical device, you're always with standards. You see, the reality of our world is that we have all of these rules and expectations. And that's the result of our culture. And the culture in which we live is formed from all of our shared understandings, our values, our attitudes, our beliefs, our underlying assumptions. And that can be broken down into microcultures, such as the microculture of your family that says you're going to go to college and you're going to have to go to nursing school with your mother. All of that forms that culture. And it breaks it down even further into microcultures, into individual companies and individual professions. So, in my role, I get to interface directly with engineers, with marketing professionals, with regulatory professionals, and most importantly, the practice of medicine. Let me come back over here to my design side, because I'm not quite done explaining that design process. When we design a medical device, we have all of these wonderful things that we have to meet. You see, we have a regulating agencies that say, in order to design a device, you're going to need to be 100%, 100% of the time, which means that we have to go and we have to research what our clinical practitioners are doing and then translate that back to design. And we have to test it in a rigorous manner that involves risk and harm. And we have to prove that our device is safe, it's effective, it's easy to use. This is mandated through several rules and several laws that we have. It's also mandated that we do good design, do it right the first time. And our regulating agencies tell us that we have to collaborate, we have to understand prior to proposing a solution. This is good. We like those rules. Think about that. As a patient, I absolutely want to have that medical device to work. Now let me jump over here to the side of the practice of medicine. These people that practice medicine, they make a commitment of long hours of training to make sure that the care that they deliver to us is 100%, 100% of the time. They wake up every day trying to do their best, making sure that they're trying to meet all of their patient needs. But they have external influences too, and they have rules and expectations that they live within. Those rules and expectations, one of them is patient privacy. That's a law. It doesn't go away. I'm talking about HIPAA. HIPAA is the rule that protects our privacy and makes sure that none of our values are, are public out there, but its impact in medicine has been both significant in large and small ways. For example, let me share with you what I've witnessed. I've witnessed healthcare providers need to change phones. It's kind of odd, right? Why would HIPAA cause them to change phones? Well, the reality is they just didn't have enough security on it, and patient information was coming to their phone. The patient information coming to their phone in the wrong hands is a problem. Another way, when you go to the emergency room, you used to be able to see on a board that would have your name. You could follow a patient. You could track it. This is where my grandma is. I know my grandma's in room three. I could see that. Well, you can't now. You need to know grandma's number. So it's changed that impact there. At one time, attendings were able to, I'm sorry, residents were able to text images to their attendings to seek advice. That's no longer the case unless everybody has the right security. Because if we don't follow HIPAA, the, the penalties are severe. Now, you'd think that the rules and these expectations are something that we may like, we may not like. The reality is we like those rules. They keep us safe, they keep us protected. So I argue that the same rules that protect us are the ones that may actually limit us. In design, over here, we think about being really creative. 
we think about alternative realities. Over here, they have no time to do that. Over here, I've got to be 100%, 100% of the time. When I'm in my design world, if I have a problem, I have the ability to just walk away, to think about it for a little while, and then come back to it when I have a solution. That's not the case if I'm a surgeon. I actually have to solve the problem right there, which draws me to this conclusion. The reality is, all people are creative. He's got a problem to solve, he's going to solve it right there. They've got a problem to solve, they're going to take a little bit more time. There are three types of people in the world. There's sideliners, they're innovators, and there's naysayers. The innovators, they take, it, they take a strong love of what they're going to do. They, take it, they all adopt technology immediately. They'll bring it in, they'll act on it. Sideliners, people that wait for it. They hold back, and naysayers, the people that always say no. In design, we're rarely the naysayers. We're always like, hey, what do I have? Over here, we find all three types, and depending upon their level of conservativeness, their level of ability of acceptance, they will adopt things immediately and bring it into their practice. See, I believe that the cultures in our individual professions influence each other every day both in positive and negative ways. And the rules that say, I have to collaborate, come into clash with some of the rules that say, I have to limit access, I have to protect patient privacy. And the reality is, between the two of these, each individual profession is set up for its own success and hasn't really realized the fact that we impact each other, both positively and negatively. As we go through our daily lives, and we're interacting with one another, how we take into that information and we use it to form ourselves and we give it to another profession means that we, it will either limit our ability or keep, our, keep, keep going. I had a beautiful speech, it was really good, and I just threw it out. Great. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> the reality is, is that rules and expectations, the ones that were given to me by my dad that said, you will go to college, you will have a job, the rules and expectations of, that are found on healthcare providers, they all form the culture in which we live. And we have a responsibility to assess where those rules happen, why they're here, ask why we're doing what it is we're doing, how we can learn from one another, and how we can move forward. The reality is, is that rules and expectations happen every day. New devices, new processes, new theories are going to happen. And they're going to happen by those who are risk takers, by those who you perceive to be crazy or even an outlier. You might have to put your credibility on the line. You might have to be one that says, maybe my colleagues don't think that I am really valid or good. And for every rule and for every expectation, there is an exception. Its name is creativity. Thank you.